So if you want to share a little bit about your journey and uh, mm. how you developed the holistic dance and mm. what was the encounter somehow that uh, uh, um, shaped your river and, uh, and then also what was your relationship uh, with touch? Maybe even before you decided to, I don't know, to make certain steps or like, so just to, yeah, to briefly um, understand um, about your process until now. Briefly, yeah. of course, because I think we could <laughs> dive and there's already everything there, but just to, to first have a frame and then we can uh, choose certain certain parts that are speaking more right now yeah well thank you again for the invitation i'm happy to be here to talk about um, my process and and my work and i think it's uh it's really relevant um in the time that is happening right now to talk about many things many things around um self-care and and touch and closeness and distances and um and staying centered <laughs> which are all qualities of dance and qualities um, that I think we can, we can sort of use, we can learn from dance and use it in daily life. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, my, my personal story is, is I felt that, I don't know, from the, from the age of three or four, I felt like I was always dancing. I was dancing in my bedroom, jumping up and down <laughs> the mattress. I was, I even remember creating steps at like four, like doing little choreographies. So I feel like it's 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 something that was always there. I didn't I didn't know where it came from, or I didn't have any didn't have any formal training until I was fifteen. I mean, there was a there was some sh I I was doing gymnastics. I was doing some short dance routines in in high school or, or middle school. But like a formal ballet or formal jazz dance training, which is what I started with, didn't start until I was 15. Mm -hmm. um, and then it became very clear that that was the thing that I, I, I needed to do also to break out of my, my home, to kind of find myself also in a difficult home situation. And, and so I always say kind of dance was my, my first dance therapy in a way when I started going to dance classes because it really sort of opened up, uh, it opened up a world to me. And yeah, I mean, in, I grew up in Vienna. I grew up in Vienna in the 70s and in the 80s where I was quite, uh, quite a different Vienna than now. Vienna now is a beautiful, open-minded, young city in the middle of Europe. When I grew up, it was at the end of Europe yep. because that Britain was 200 kilometers away. And, and there was a lot of leftovers of, um, of the Second World War, the Nazi regime. There was a lot of unconscious and unresolved guilt issues around the population. Um, Austria did not deal with its history and the participation of its history until, until the late 80s. And so it was a very, very dense, very sort of um, psychologically kind of unfree environment, which as a sensitive child, I just sort of picked up, but I didn't, I didn't know what it was. It was just kind of, ooh, yeah, it didn't feel right. And all I wanted to do was leave basically, which is what I did. I left right after high school, I went to Chicago um, I stayed there. I stayed in the U.S. altogether for nine years and in Chicago for seven years. And I fell in love with modern dance, which was really, yeah, and, and opening. I felt really, I felt really at home with it. I, I studied Le Monde, I studied Graham, I studied um, anatomy, I studied, you know, all sort of the the, I really ha I have a Bachelor's of Arts in Modern Dance and uh, I had a really good education at Columbia College, Chicago. Um, it was very improvisation based, yeah. which I did not know at the time was not, uh, was not normal for, for bachelors, yeah. especially in the US. 
uh, we had a ton of improvisation and uh, also the company that I danced with, which was part of, of um, sort of that whole environment. There was Columbia College, um, whose artistic director was also the artistic director of her own company, Mordine and Company. And uh, Shirley Mordine, she would also base her choreography on improvisation. So I was, you know, my understanding of dance and dance technique was, developed parallel to my understanding of improvisation wow. uh, and and uh, a professional development also in the sense that there were um, there were all these companies performing there we were in the city uh, we, the, it was also the main presenter of modern dance so we would be training we would be training as students in the beginning I was still a student then I was a professional dancer but we would be training with Trisha Brown Company and Bilty Jones and and Merce Cunningham Company. They would come and, and do their classes, their warm up classes, and then we could watch rehearsals and then they would perform at night. So it was a very terrible environment to become a professional dancer and a choreographer. It just kind of sort of happened automatically. Choreographing came out of improvising, came out of my studies there. And so much of what I still use now, um, I learned there, which is really the principles, the principles of, of uh, or the, the elements of dance, you know, time, body, force, and space. Mm -hmm. It's something that we use uh, in improvisation all the time, even though we might not know it consciously. And, uh, and there I also had my first uh, uh, contact improvisation as part of my studies. I was about to ask when that yeah. happened. <laughs> yes. Kathleen Maltese, she's kind of, she's kind of the, the mom of contact in, in Chicago. She, she came in and she was part of the, the improv classes. And so I think at 20, I had my first uh, introduction to contact. Mm -hmm. And then I remember Chris Aiken, uh, who is still also teaching in Europe, um, came to do a residency. And I had my, I, I call it my first contact high because I was, um, I, he was demonstrating an exercise with me and I totally like didn't recognize, like he only wanted a little bit of the exercise and I just kind of flew off and started dancing with him. And at the end uh, he said, okay, that's not what I was wanting to do. <laughs> but it was great. And, but it gave me, it gave me this first sense of what, what contact improvisation can do also when you put it in the context of, uh, of a contemporary dance field. Yeah, I think Chris really, uh, really unifies that in the sense that he's a contemporary dance teacher, he's an academic dance teacher, and he's so much part of the contact community. Um, that, uh, and I feel very connected to that because I am a contemporary dancer. Yeah, who ended up then focusing more and more towards contact and improvisation and authentic movement later on mm -hmm. in my development. So basically I went to Chicago. I had a dance career on stage, um, behind the stage. I did like 10 years of crazy dancing all the time. My life was dedicated to dance, um, to this kind of professional dance. And at one point I, uh, I got quite burned out. I got quite burned out on dancing, um, dancing with the separation of the artist and the audience. I remember we were quite successful at the time. We founded our own company, which was called Loop Troop. I was dancing with all these fabulous collaborators, friends of mine. We would open up uh, a theater and people would come and more and more people would come. And, and I felt more and more lonely. <laughs> the bigger the ages got, the more lonely I felt and the harder I trained or the more performances we did, I felt, I felt more and more distance coming in. And, and I think that happens to many of us. I think it happens to many of us that as a professional dancer, you train so hard to, um, to perfect your body, to perfect your art, that you really lose touch with life. You lose touch with what's going on outside of the studio. Yeah. And there was a point where I stopped dancing um, 
and and I really had to re in, reinvent myself and find a new place for dance in it. Mm-hmm. And here is actually, and this is where we come around to the issue of touch. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the biggest initiations that I had was when I was 25. In I was still in Chicago. I went. Uh, I went to a healer. I went to this man who was recommended by a friend of mine and uh, he he had learned from the Hopi Indians he had learned a technique from the Hopi Indians which is kind of very similar to roughing so it's very deep tissue work but he was also medium so he could also channel some information and I sat down in front of him and he basically told me all about my past lives and my future lives and you know he just like totally read my energy uh, system and then he gave me he gave me a healing session and I came out um, totally different totally different Um, at the time I didn't know what had happened Uh, it took me many many years to even understand that this was a healing session and an initiation in a way um, but my trajectory changed from there. It changed from me wanting to just be a professional dancer and a choreographer to me becoming, um, uh, investigating something that is larger than just dance for the arts, dance for an audience. I'm going to make a stop here for a moment. <laughs> sure. Take a little break. Wow, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing. Yeah. It's very interesting how one specific episode, which is not by chance, but somehow it's also chance, like, you know, can, uh, can change so much, you know, the path. And, uh, and somehow you were ready to that, like you were already into that process. So he really... Um, he really, how you say, embodied the medium, like to to give you this. Uh... I feel like he, he just he sort of uh, laid free what was already there. Yeah. yeah he. Yeah. And I think like a lot of the work that we do also in authentic movement is is really about uncovering some of the layers or letting go of some of the layers. Um, Tiki Jung, he also he always talks about that all of the seeds of our lives are already inside of us. We just have to connect to them and water them and give them space to grow. And what this healer did, he basically, he, he helped me to connect at 25 to a deeper layer of, of some of my direction, of some of my purpose, which I already felt before. Um, and it took me still many, many years because I was very much identified as a dancer. Yeah? As, as I had this image of me you know, spending my life um, as a professional dancer, which I still do, it's just not the path that was just uh, that particular sort of technical stage dancer. Yeah. It took me many years to figure out what can it be, including a whole aspect of healing practices, a whole aspect of uh, social interaction, um, of, of a way of connecting with life, with nature. Yeah. It took many, many years then from then on to investigate that. And, the place where I am right now with having, uh, having an institute and doing trainings for, for more than 10 or 15 years now. Um, and it, it, it took all of these steps and it took all of that search for it. Um, basically what happened is, is after I, I went to Kurt, who was this healer, um, I went to New York and then I started doing more contact improvisation. I started really committing to contact and to authentic movement, which is uh, what I discovered at Earth Dance. I did that for the first time there. And so a whole new world opened up that um, was not geared towards the stage. Yeah, I could use all of my skills as a dancer in a contact jam. I could use um, sort of my, or I could reconnect to my joy of dancing just for dancing's sake, not having to go to auditions, not having to go to rehearsals, not having, not dancing for an end product, but just being in the moment. Mm-hmm. Also connecting to people who were not professional dancers, who were not, yeah, 
you know, I mean, this is what I love about contact is, is, is that, you know, we get to dance with so many different kinds of people, different ages, different skill levels, people with different abilities, but also different professions. Yeah. And that it's not just confined to the small area of, of a population. And then it took me many, many years to 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 find a path. I uh, just to kind of finish my story a little. I tried to do it shortly because it's a long story. Is I came back after ten years of of being out outside of my home, and I came back and I ended up getting a job um, at a rehabilitation center um, for people after severe accidents. Um, severe car and uh, or work accidents and here I really started working with people with trauma yeah people who had severe body and and psychological trauma there were also um, many people on a psychiatric with a psychiatric diagnosis many people with brain injuries spinal cord injuries and I was a dancer yeah I was a professional dancer and I came to this place and Basically, I started doing a form of dance therapy uh, within a rehabilitation. I was part of a, a larger team with psychologists and psychotherapists and, and physiotherapists. And I got to explore what it means with all the elements that I had learned, the elements of dance, contact, authentic movement, meditation, uh, body awareness training that I had had how to apply that um, for people who, who had just been severely, severely traumatized, mm -hmm. yeah? And, and to see that really at the core of it, basically we're all the same. <laughs> we all have bodies. We all need movement to heal. More or less touch. Not everybody was able to go into touch, but if you, if if people were able to go into even small areas of touch, how healing touch can be, mm -hmm. how basic the breath is, how basic awareness is to the healing process. And I worked there for fourteen years, realizing and and um, investigating what I what I learned from being a professional dancer. And what can be useful in uh, in a rehabilitation process, in a healing process, in a physical and psychological healing process, mm -hmm. and that's the basis for for the work that I do now. Um, I decided at one point that I I want to uh, I want to share the skills that I learned or the experiences that I have, how to work with movement, dance and touch to as many people as possible so that many of us can go out into the world and share it with other people, professionally or personally, that, um, yeah, we can, we, even if you are not a professional dancer, but you like to move or you like to dance, uh, that you can you can pass it on to your friends or you can pass it on to the community where you live in, you can pass it on, um to yourself to your own in the practice of being in nature and connecting to movement and connecting to nature on a different level so yeah, yeah. um i would be curious to 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 dig a bit deeper into the qualities of touch and yeah. you were saying before about framing and the references of of, of touch no so that that can help to have a kind of uh, uh, common language, common understanding of, of what we mean with this touch so that, uh, of course, people are coming with their stories and, uh, and we, we cannot know uh, their relationship to, you know, to the physical contact and proximity. Um, and of course, uh, depending on the context, we can uh, address more or less about certain topics related to touch. So um, I wonder how you move there, how you dance there with this uh, being very sensitive to, you know, um, that it can, be, it can be a big deal for some people, but at the same time knowing what you do, so with, with, uh, with clarity. So, and I think there's an interplay there that needs to be, that, that cannot be fixed. No, it's not a recipe. It depends on the context, it depends on the group, it depends what you're doing, it depends. Yeah. And this is also very connected to what we do with Play Fight. So that's why I'm also interested to hear your 
approach your experience there? Well, uh, we live in a special time right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, depending on the country uh, that, that you're in, I mean, I'm in Austria right now. Um, and even though sort of the restrictions of, of the Corona times, most of them have sort of relaxed. We're still not allowed to teach contact workshops. Yeah, we're not allowed to go into direct touch unless you wear a mask or you have a lot of uh, sanitary um, sort of sanitary measures around. And um, body workers can already work again, but they have to follow all these rules. And so right now I feel like it's quite difficult to actually go into, into a full, or it's not even allowed to have a full contact jam or, or contact class. Um, and depending on what country you live in, I think it, it's, it's also sort of, it's a big issue, you know, I mean, it's a big issue. We were all sort of asked to stay home. Um, and uh, depending on how you live, if you have family, if you have kids, if you have a partner, you were either lacking the touch or you also had too much maybe. Yeah, I mean, I have friends who have three kids and had to do home office and the kids were all over them all the time while doing their home office. So, and I know that from myself, from my children, when they were little, you know, too, too much touch can also be too much sometimes, yeah. yeah. Um, but coming back to your action, so I feel like the issue of touch is always uh, an essential one, yeah. And it, it, it sort of, uh, it depends on the environment that you live in. It depends on, on sort of the outer circumstances that you live in. But at the core of it, touch is the first sense that develops in, in utero, yeah? So when we're babies, when we're, when we're, when we're <laughs> yeah, the, the baby inside of the mother develops its sense of touch or, or the skin develops at the same time as the sense of touch as the nervous system in the six or seven week. Before hearing, before seeing, uh, before smelling uh, and tasting. So the sense of touch is at the core level of how we experience life. Yeah, And even if we don't have another human being to touch, we're touching, I'm touching the surface of my desk right now. I'm touching, uh, I can touch myself. I even touched the, you know, the clothes that I wear, the bed sheets that I wear. Yeah. So it is, it's, it's how we know where we start, where we end. Yeah, the skin is the boundary of our body. And even though, you know, the spirit might go a different direction or you'd be larger than my physical body, physically it is contained by my skin. And the skin has so many functions, yeah? So everything related to touch is so much to the core of our being, how we experience ourselves in the world whether we feel safe, whether we feel welcomed, whether we feel loved, and whether we feel nourished, yeah? Um, if it's too cold, if it's too warm, um, if there is toxins outside, if we're in an environment and it's toxic, we're gonna feel it not only through our sense and our smell, I mean, our, our taste and our smell, we're gonna feel it first in our skin, yeah? So, um, it's essential to our being, yeah? And parallel to that early development is, of course, also the development uh, in our early childhood. How, how were we welcomed into this world? Yeah, how much, uh, how much were we held by our parents? How much were we breastfed? Yeah? Did you get to experience the breast of your mother in your face, yeah, on the skin, yeah? How, um, how harsh was the environment that you were in? Were you really comfortable, yeah, on the skin level, yeah? And even though I would say many of us probably, hopefully received quite a lot of touch in the early years, the older we get, the less touch we receive, yeah? Because we don't, in the, in the Western world, we don't live in a, yeah. a touch-friendly environment, yeah? I mean, there's different cultures who treat touch in a different way, yeah? Um, we have certain rules around touch. Shaking hands is okay. Somebody who's close to us to hug them, it's okay for 
for women it's it's sometimes easier to be also openly intimate with other women to hold hands or to to caress each other but also for men you know boys growing up it's very difficult around the issue of touch yeah and many of us have to sort of regain a sense of trust around that issue regain a sense of ability to receive touch and I think that that is the biggest issue of our time right now also besides corona yeah but the big issues that we have also in the contact community or in the bodywork community yeah is is that we have and I I, I have to quote um, uh, Heike, uh, Heike Purian who put this very beautifully because she said it's either too much or too little yeah either we have too little touch which most of us have had yeah we we have a touch hunger in our society yeah we yeah. we crave the touch we crave the intimacy we crave we crave non-intentional touch yeah. Yeah? most of the touch that we want or we get is either um sexual yeah, sort of confined to a relationship. Okay, here is my partner, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, and I have sexual intimate relationships with him, and so this is why I touch. Yeah. What we are learning, what we're able to sort of investigate in contact is is non-intentional touch or touch that is in connection with movement. Yeah, but it's not directed at a certain goal or it's not directed at a certain relationship. Mm -hmm. Parent and child, there is a certain sort of uh, format where it's okay to touch. Yeah, but as adults, you know, the moment you start being closer to somebody on the street, people are going to assume that you're lovers. People, yeah, so that, that connection is immediate. Yeah. yeah? especially if it's tender, especially if it's sort of attentive, yeah? So what we're learning now, what we're learning in these times is how to give and to receive touch that is, um, has a clear intention, mm -hmm. has a clear boundary also, um, and is, is, uh, is in agreement yeah with the two people touching I, I i just thought about the word consensus but it's so loaded that i'm yeah. using it <laughs> yeah. yeah um so one way one one time in my teacher's training i started i started naming the contexts of touch that we as dance teachers for instance work with because i think there's a lot of confusion around um when people come to contact jams uh what is this yeah, depending on is if this is a class or a workshop or is this just a jam. Um, you know, people who have never done contact improvisation, they're often confused. I mean, you know, I was confused. I still sometimes get confused <laughs> at a contact jam. What is this right now? Yeah. And I think if we kind of keep in mind that uh, touch as a means for movement, yeah or touch as a means to establish communication, mm -hmm. touch to give impulses, yeah? Those are three main contexts that we can endlessly work with, yeah? So the quality of touch, how, uh, how hard or how soft, if it's on the skin only, or if it's, it's fascia that I'm actually connecting to, the body parts that I'm touching, these are all things that we can learn yeah, we can, and this is part of what I do in my trainings, is training people, how can we, in our workshops, teach people um, to find areas where it's easy to receive touch, yeah, yeah? body parts, yeah, I always call them hot spots, yeah, the face, the hand, those are hot spots, yeah, those are intimate places, yeah, you don't have to avoid them, but it's not where we're naturally going for when we dance in contact, yeah. There's another level of touch that comes more in through the somatic uh, sort of practice. I, I combine a lot of uh, uh, body work or somatic exploration, applied anatomy uh, into my movement uh, workshops. And there's this whole other level of touch just really releasing tension, releasing, creating softness in the nervous system, really connecting to deeper levels of self 
that sort of prepare us then to enter a contact dance much easier, much more fluid, much more connected to ourselves, much more connected to the floor. And, um, and, and we need the touch of another person to, in some ways, to fully release. Yeah. So those are all the really good things around touch. That's the that's stuff that we hunger for. Yeah. And of course, there's this other area where there's where it goes into overstepping boundaries and um, where we are very, very easily triggered by early childhood or by by, you know, sexual assault or any overstepping of boundaries that we have experienced in our life. And it's a big issue. But I like to concentrate on the good stuff. <laughs> I like to concentrate on, on the context that we work in um, uh, to say, okay, touch is something that we really, really need. Yeah, it's a scent, it's food, it's nu it's nutrition. Yeah, I think even doctors, uh, I think in medicine, they're finding out that uh, that that we need as human beings, we need touch to survive. If you if if you don't, if a baby is not touched, it will die. Yeah, and even though we're adults and we won't die, we we still on a very deep level of experiencing experiencing ourselves as as alive and as juicy and as open. We need to touch as a basis for for our yeah our liveliness in this world. Yeah, yeah. and it's interesting because um, in order to to become more clear with our intention, with the kind of, you know, with what are we transmitting with our touch and kind of also an empathic touch so that we can read the feedback from the, from the body of the other person. The only way is to explore touch, to really start to explore all, it's, it's a range of possibilities and qualities. And I remember in your seminar uh, in Vienna that um, one morning we, we did a kind of body work and you gave us very clear um, kind of touch so you have this this and this and then you can play in between but you need to be very clear um, with this specific kind of touch so it kind of releases the, the mind from uh, uh, from an intention you, you focus on the quality and then the more you explore all the qualities and the more you you can start to uh, to guide your touch and um, but for that we really need the experience and practice and there is very little chance in in our everyday yeah. life if you don't go into this field that, that we share and this for me sometimes is a bit um yeah it, it triggers me and challenges me right to to see how how little space there is for this exploration no with the uh, with the right state of mind, with the right agreement, as you said, you know. So, um, I would like now, think, especially yeah. now that even more we are forced to to not go there and, and yeah. you know and to feel safe. To feel safe, we should not touch. Well, I have I have two things to add to what you're saying yeah. right now, um, which is uh, one connecting to what I said earlier is is that usually we always had an intention of touching. Um, if we're talking about a sexual relationship, there's also, there's always this level of arousal involved, yeah? And arousal desire sort of creates a whole other story, yeah? It creates, it creates uh, an energy of fire that is built up and leads towards a certain activity, yeah? And I'm not saying that's bad at all, yeah? I love sex and I love sort of uh, also the tantric e e e um, path, in terms of learning about that, yeah? But I think it's important for us as dance teachers to differentiate that from what we're doing. Yeah. We can use some of that energy, we can use some of that sensuality, and uh, we can have some ecstatic dances, yeah? But I think it's important for us to make that differentiation between where the sensuality stop and begin uh, and where the sexuality begin. And of course, it's a blurry line, yeah? Um, the main thing, I think the main, main, main thing in, in all of this is listening, yeah? Listening, and it's such a core quality in contact improvisation, such a core principle of anything that we do um, in improvisation, but especially in contact, yeah? So if I have, if, if I also as a teacher invite the quality of listening, then I will also 
I would listen to myself. How comfortable am I in, in the touch? How comfortable am I in how close I am to this other person? Um, if I have a listening quality, then most likely, it's not always for sure, but most likely I will receive feedback from my partner. Yeah. If I touch somebody and they freeze up, I know it's probably not so good. Yeah. Yep. And or if I touch them at a certain body part and they keep on moving away from that body part, yeah, it's also a piece of information. There's very many ways of saying no, and and we need to listen. We need to listen to what kind of quality of touch invites what kind of quality of interaction. Yeah, and that applies to life yeah it's not just contact it applies to life it applies to my children i have two teenagers yeah at times they're very happy if i touch them at times they go like yeah you know, mom Ugh. yeah stay away yeah. yeah and and the other thing that uh, is important that you mentioned this is also in the body work uh, but i think it also applies to dancing is is that we're not here to fix somebody we're not here to heal anybody. Yeah. So if we're giving, if we're giving bodywork sessions or if we're doing exploration in somatic uh, fields, um, all of the trainers they will always tell tell you we're not here. I, I cannot fix anybody. I cannot heal anybody. What I can do is I can share my attention through my hands. I can share my consciousness in this moment, my presence with another body at this moment, yeah? And, and then we can see what happens if, if my partner sort of takes the invitation for a deeper breath, takes the invitation to either move into that touch or to you know, relax deeper into the floor or into my hands, yeah? But it's, it's invitations and that has a different quality to I know what I'm, what I, I know what you need. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you need and I know how to fix you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's a much more sort of softer approach or more, um, I, I also call it a feminine approach in, in that sense. And it, it includes all of us. Yeah. It's not specific to, to male or female, but sort of inviting a feminine space uh, in the sense that we can, we can say no, we can say no to the touch if we don't want, or we can say no to certain aspects of the touch. But the, but the basic in ingredient to that is listening, listening and accepting if the other person is, is taking that invitation or not. Yeah. And to the current situation, I think what, what's interesting right now is, is that I feel that uh, many, many people are very hungry for the touch and waiting, kind of waiting, when is the next contact jam going to happen or when is the next contact workshop going to happen? And I have to say, I think it's also really good practice <laughs> to go and, I mean, I'm talking about those of us who have been dancing and in the contact field for a long time, yeah? There's also, uh, there's also a tendency for us because we get so much, so much nourishment, nourishment from the touch or from the dance to forget that we can give ourselves a lot of, a, a lot of self-centering, a lot of self-centering uh, in the sense of the dance practice. So I can touch myself. I can touch myself anytime I want. Most of the time we don't do that, yeah? I can touch the floor anytime I want. I can be in contact with somebody else even though they're not physically present. I am in contact with you right now. And of course it's not the same, yeah? But closeness is not the same as contact. I can establish closeness with somebody who's standing a meter away through my presence, through my breath, through my attention, through, um, through my skin of, of going into contact without physical contact. And I think we forget about that sometimes. We forget that, um, that, that there's actually, there's so much practice before we actually go into contact. 
there's so much that we need to we can need to explore yeah about working from our center about releasing our weight about orienting ourselves in the space about reaching from the center about um connecting to myself before i connect to somebody else i mean this is also why i combine authentic movement so much with my practice of contact improvisation because i feel like there's so so many of us who are so easily going into the symbiosis of contact that we need kind of this practice of holding our own yeah where am i coming from what what's going on with me right now where's my impulse coming from my movement impulse where's where are my feelings at? Yeah. What is it that I really need? Yeah. As a way of then interacting with somebody from a more stable place, from a more mature place, also mature in the sense of I don't need you to find myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can do all of these things, but it's like relationships. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> it's like, it's yeah. Like relationships, if I know how to be with myself and truly be happy with myself, yeah, yeah and content, yeah, then I, it's going to be much easier for me to relate to somebody else and be in relationship because I'm not so needy, yeah. And but the other end is sort of people who are afraid of touch right now, people who sort of are triggered on early on early memories of receiving touch that was dangerous i feel like many of us are, are there there are the fear of contracting something the fear of uh something sort of entering their body that is not safe may it be a virus or may it be i don't know you know is is something that um is also at the core of, of human nature. You know, I think it's it's sort of this safety regulation of, okay, there was, you know, I don't know, we were out in the desert and there was a snake and, and there's, a, there's a safety reflex of saying, okay, there's a wild animal, I don't know if it's safe, yeah? I do not touch that snake. I'm gonna try and get away from that snake. That is, uh, that's a reflex, yeah? That's safety measurement. Yeah. And, and so for, for people who are not as used to the pleasure of touch, who are not used to the safe, safe arena of where you can be free in receiving touch, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important time to look at um, how can I reestablish good connections with people where I do feel safe? Yeah? How can I look at the issues that I have around closeness and of touch? I think for all of us on both ends of the spectrums of those of us who are so hungry and needy for touch and those of us who are really afraid of the touch, I think it just, it really brings out um, the deeper issues, yeah, that were always there before, yeah. I mean, touch was always, is always a hot issue, even before Corona, but it sort of gives us the possibility to just look at it a little bit deeper, a little bit closer saying, okay, what is there to heal? Yeah, can I can I identify where that comes from? Is it is it the the adult me that's reacting to this, or is it I don't know the four year old that received some uncomfortable touch from the grandfather? Yeah, or in some sort, or in the kindergarten, or in some weird situation, or or if we grew up in a family that was touched hostile yeah where there was no warm sort of interaction yeah or on the other hand if you grew up in an environment where there were overbearing touch or or sexually sort of yeah sexual touch that was not appropriate yeah even i'm not even talking about severe abuse i'm just talking about uncomfortable situations many of us many women many men yeah, but many women especially have received uncomfortable boundary crossing touch. Yeah. It's all in there. Yes. It's, it's huge. Yeah. Do you do you see or do you feel or you you fear the risk of a uh, kind of storing a certain new fear, new fear on top of maybe other mm. fears or 
um, in the way we, we react to each other. So kind of uh, creating a new, pat new patterns of, um, of repositioning, of reaction to each other based on this kind of forced period where exactly it, it is uh, claimed that we are more we're more safe if we stay distant so i don't think some people can can for sure make this uh, work of self-awareness and use it as a chance as an opportunity to mm -hmm. to re-establish their relationship to touch and proximity and see what is there that they can transform or that they can uh, feed but maybe for another group of people you can uh, really mark even more certain patterns of, of, of reaction and, and even in the just in the mind kind of store this fear so do you see this risk do you do you fear it or somehow you well, trust I, I, what i what i feel right now is what we talked about earlier i feel like it's a transition time mm. yeah um I mean, just the specific period right now is, is, is a transition time for most countries. It depends where you live, yeah? But most of, most of the countries are sort of out of the severe lockdown, but there's still some restrictions, and especially concerning um, dance seminars and contact. And, and, and we're transitioning out of these two or three months of being, most of us being isolated or being confined in a certain way. And also depending on how I think it a lot it lot depends on how how heavily you're into consuming media and how heavily you sort of your mind sort of kind of taps on to some of the scenarios or some of the um the possibilities of um democratic values being sort of restricted or you know if there's a vaccination or not or forced vaccination and you know, there's a lot of fear that if you want to, you could tap into. Um, and it's a choice. It's a choice that we make. It's a choice that we make. How much media do we consume? How much do we believe what's out there? How much do we read? And how much time do we spend feeling ourselves and our environment? Yeah. At one point, I decided to listen to what is it that I, at the moment, am I feeling also when I go out into nature? Um, there's this great article from uh, Charles I, uh, Eisenstein. Uh, he talks about Corona Nation, and it's a very, very inclusive article. It's very long, but it's brilliant in that sense that um, he talks about all the different angles of Corona, um, all the different points of views that you could jump on and take on and sort of... Um, grow your fear <laughs> with it yeah but at the end he talks about our fear of death yeah <laughs> if we're alive all what we have in common is is the basic fear of death and if we are if we're going to be constantly afraid of death we stop living yeah you can't have children if you're afraid of death because they're like the biggest risk the moment you bring them in, in into their lives. You know, the first three years you're you're like constantly busy with trying to protect them not to not to fall down, not to get hurt, not to run over the street, not to yeah. So life is a huge risk. Life is, you know, if you go if you live in a big city, the risk of being driven out, you know, like that a car drives into you is, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's huge. Yeah, to have a car accident, it's huge. The risk of contracting the disease is huge, yeah? So do we spend our life thinking about all the risks, all the variations of possibilities of us getting sick, all the variations of us getting hurt in interaction, or do we spend our lives focusing on the quality of touch that's present right now, on the quality of interaction that's present right now, on, on nature, how beautiful it is, on, on my breath, on, on this wonder of a body that can move and, and feel and perceive and I experience myself through. So I think it's really a question of where do I put my focus on? And the other thing is, is I feel that for, for me as a dance teacher right now, I feel like what I'm doing 
um, like Malcolm Manning and I were offering this two week summer somatic training this summer in July in Vienna. <laughs> um, what we're doing is, is we're creating spaces to go slow. Mm. We're creating spaces to go step by step. Mm-hmm. Malcolm is offering a workshop in the morning about rolling, grounding and arriving. And I'm doing a workshop uh, with Authentic Movement, which is called That Which Is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then in the second week, we go a little bit deeper into the somatic exploration and into the improvisation. But what we have decided to do is to give ourselves time, yeah. transition time, to come out of this sort of strange time, <laughs> this totally unexpected thing coming over us, to feel where there is still stress in our body, to feel if there is fear and to be kind with these, these parts of ourselves and to, to reconnect to our, to our physical self. And I think it's, I mean, it's how I work in my work anyway. I always start um, with solo dancing before I go into contact. I, I start with connecting to myself first. And this is what we're giving people time to, connecting to the floor, connecting to the breath, um, we don't know if it's going to be allowed to touch um, in by July. Um, if we do, we're, we're going to do some some bodywork sessions where it's easier to control sort of the the uh, everything around uh, infection risk. Um, probably we won't do a lot of contact because it's 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 still you know you're supposed to have a meter distance. Um, but it's, it's, it's all in the same package anyway. Yeah. We might have to be a little patient to go for the full contact, but what we have the possibility right now is to, to practice some of these other really, really important principles. And these principles give us the possibility to go step by step, to go slow. And I think for most of us during this Corona time, what was the biggest gift of Corona is slowing down, slowing down. Mm -hmm. down. Well, it's probably for you too, right? Yeah, and I think our bodies need that. Our psyche needs that. Our bodies need that. So that is my approach. And and to take people seriously and to say, I understand. I understand that some of these deep fears are being triggered. But movement is such, movement is so healing. Yeah, so healing. And this is really something that I learned from, from working in the rehab center. Yeah, at the core of it, the body can be so so traumatized, so hurt, so so much in pain even. Movement and touch and breath, it's magic. It's really, really magic. Yeah, if you don't do it too fast and if you do it consciously and if you give people space to feel themselves within within that process, I think it's 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 magic and I think the opportunity that we have right now is to use it, to reuse it, to reconnect, to slow down. We connect to ourselves and see what our body needs now, step by step. And then to see what's the effect on our, our quality of contact after that. I'm really, really curious <laughs> to how the contact jams are going to be after that, how contact workshops are going to look like after that. Did we learn something from it? Yeah? Mm-hmm. I'm even realizing now my, my own um, feeling at the moment, which... Uh, there's a part of me that, as you said, is so much in a need of going back into to touch and to uh, move with other bodies, feel my body in relation to another body. But at the same time, there's a part of me that is keep on, on no, it's, it's not the time yet. Wait a little bit longer. And mm-hmm. so there's also some, uh, some kind of resistance in jumping again into it mm-hmm. like it was before. Yeah. So, uh, and yeah, it's what you said, like it, there's a need of a transition and there's a need still to, co- to keep cultivating what we found in this period, which uh, gave us the chance to slow down. And in the slowing down, you know, sensitivity and perception can expand and there are, there are things that we could not see before because we were into, into our um, momentum and rush. So, yeah, yeah and then... You, you already answered to one of the last questions was kind of if you have an advice or how mm-hmm. we can support each other in this and yeah. yeah. 
Well, I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, I have, I have many year, like uh, longer ongoing groups, like I have these teachers trainings and, and like an authentic movement year long group. And um, basically for the last three months, I was not able to hold them um, and we had to postpone them, but I was still in contact uh, with many of my participants through Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, but the self practice is so important. Uh, the self practice and it's, it's kind of a phenomena that because we have so much fun in the studio together, we forget that we can do it by ourselves. <laughs> and I think it's really, really important. It's important that we, and it doesn't have to be about discipline or it doesn't have to be about, oh, I have to do this. Yeah. Um, you know, I created this holistic dance card set, which where I collected 76 different exercises, half of them solo and half of them partner cards. And part of the reason why I created it is, is so that we can use some of these exercises at home. Yeah, you do yoga at home, which, yeah, but we can also dance at home. And it was very funny with these Zoom meetings, um, you know, all over the country, all over the world. I you do a lot um, with people with, in Russia also. And that, you know, even when people have small living rooms or small bedrooms, and there's quote unquote, not a lot of space, yeah? People, because we were confined and that was the place we were moving, people were starting to move on their beds. They're starting to move with the sliding doors of their, um, uh, of, of sort of their shells. And they were starting to kind of acquire a sense of, of their space at home as part of their body space so that we don't separate our body time from the studio and then at home we only sit in our chairs or we only do our chores and there's the bed that we lie on and even if we have small apartments we can still roll around we can still dance with our couch we can yeah we can take the practice inside of our lives yeah and of course also if you have the possibility to go into nature go outside and dance dance with the floor dance with dance with the sky dance with the tree dance with the air i mean it's it's yeah, there's a whole world out there. Yeah? And I, I mean, maybe this goes back now to my story again. I, mm. I remember when I, when I sort of was really, really confused about what professional dance was about for me at the end of my 20s. I, I traveled in my car around the US. I, 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 I was a nomad living out of my car for half a year. And I basically visited my friends and contact jams and national parks. So that was, those were my three guidelines, yeah? Jams, friends, and national parks. And I started dancing in nature. I started being somewhere in the most beautiful areas, uh, wildlife areas. And all I could do was, was dance, yeah? And I danced for myself. I danced for the snake that was somewhere out far away. And I danced for the sky and I danced for the immense beauty. And I think we forget that. I think we forget that when we are so caught up in sort of a um, daily life or also a profession, you know, where we rent spaces and we go or there's a contact jam and then I go. So I guess my advice for everybody always and especially now is dance whenever you can. And it can be, it can be very little. You can lie on the floor and you let your fingers yeah, dance through the cracks of the floor. Dance is an inner movement. Dance is not something that has to be big and acrobatic. Dance is when you move inside, yeah, when you let yourself be moved. Yeah, it came in my mind this word now, integration. So we are in a transition moment of integration of what was before, what we experienced in this strange period and yeah, and what will come so yeah to not already change our our state of mind you know into okay let's let's go back to how it was before like okay we it was actually a, a big opportunity although it was challenging and for sure it's gonna have some also consequences that right now we cannot uh, we cannot yeah. see yet but um, yeah and i think it will help us I think so many of us know that from the experience, but also as a reminder, if we are centered within ourselves, if we are centered in our bodies, yeah, it's much easier than to kind of make sense of the world, 
Yeah. If, if, if I can feel myself, if I can feel my heart, if I can feel my gut, if I can feel the boundaries of my body, if I can feel my connection to the earth and to my environment, then it's much easier to kind of say, okay, there is a piece of information that comes from media, from a friend, from a neighbor, and then I can use myself to sort of uh, navigate through that. Is that a piece of information that I go into resonance with? Is that a piece of information that I want to let into my sphere? Yeah, or is it, I'm just gonna say it, a mind fuck of somebody somewhere out there? Yeah, or is it so fear based that I I can sense that if it comes inside of me, it's gonna change some of where I am actually at? Yeah. So again, the core practice applicable to life. Yeah. And I think it, but I think what it needs, it, it needs slowing down, it needs listening and it needs the self practice. So we can see, okay, there's, there's a friend, there's, those are my loved ones. And I, I resonate with them. I, I agree. Yeah. Even if it's not just from my mind, but yeah, here we are. Yeah. Creating our life also step by step. And there are huge changes out there, huge changes. It's all possibly also a divide, yeah? Big division between people who, who think in a certain way and live in a certain way and, and us, I say that, yeah? But there's also, I also feel like there is so much development that's had, that has already happened. I feel, what, I, I, what I could really feel during the corona time, also thinking about my profession, me as a professional, you know, living off of off of this work, supporting my children off of this work, from I could feel how big the community is, yeah. And it's not just the content community; it's the dance community. It's the work that you and Bruno do. It's the work that uh, somatic the somatic field engages in. People who who are working with connection, yeah. And there's many of us already. There are so many of us where we know that there's a deeper truth behind all of this. Um, it just, it takes practice. It takes practice and really dedication um, and connection, which is what you're doing right now. <laughs> it's connecting with me. So. Wow. Sabine, yeah. what can I say more? <laughs> I mean, we could open up, I think, a thousand of doors while you were speaking because you touched so many very very deep and rich uh, topics and i would have loved to jump into so many of your of your unfolding but i think it's it's great i think we really went through a, an inspiring journey and i and i hope that uh, people will will dive with us and when they when they're gonna listen to it so thank you very much for, for yeah. your availability and your warmth and and in the in the guidelines now there was this uh, yeah difference or interconnection between physical contact and connection and it just came out from what you yeah. from what you shared yeah. now so focusing on what what is connection what do we mean with connection how we can cultivate connection and how we can support each other to to connect and there's so many different ways so many yeah. different ways not yeah. only touch, not only you know closeness, proximity, but also through that. So mm. yeah. So let's keep on uh, yeah. connecting. <laughs> thank you, Esther. Thank you for this this opportunity. Also, thank you, Bruno, for for both of you creating um, your investigation field. Um, I feel like you are. You are you are bringing people together also in a way by doing these interviews and uh, uh, yeah thank you for the the possibility to speak about my work and and where I am right now um, and um, yeah I'd just love to hear from you again anytime so. hope to see you soon in, in yes. real life yes. for this hug that I dreamt about yes, yes. yes. I mean forward to that okay thank you bye bye.